turn to the perhaps more difficult uh, area of handling some questions. Uh, I have had prior notification from at least three MEPs who wanted to ask a question. So if they're there, I hope they are, I'll ask first of all Eva Kiley uh, to put her question. Hi, thank you and uh, congratulations for uh, uh, not just moderating this amazing event, but giving us uh, so much data and making uh, excellent conclusions. And I want to thank uh, Michelle Rivasi and uh, Ivo Christoph uh, for um, uh, pushing a lot to conclude this uh, study in 2020. So before, as you said, um, it's too late. So we have enough evidence to base our data on. So I would like to ask, uh, especially on the uh, health discussion, because uh, I heard some some um, concerns of uh, deploying uh, 5G as a, as a major experiment on human population and that we need to guarantee safety, but at the same time that the um, exposure limits um, are already at the safe level of, of safe level, uh, at the 4G level, so they will not actually increase much the the risk so i would like to understand the balance there if uh, somebody would like to to respond to that um would you feel comfortable as scientists uh, for policy makers to um to proceed and deploy 5g would you be happy to live in a city where 5g is being deployed because these are the questions i'm being asked and i don't have the scientific expertise to to respond um, so I would like to ask you, what would you do if you were um, us? And if you um, think that we could start deploying 5G at the safety levels we have now, but um, make sure that it will not be deployed for, I don't know, a specific number of devices or above a specific frequency, um, and do you think we should uh, uh, have also safety checks? Do you expect we have the technology that some some cities or some organizations would use the biggest frequencies, the highest frequencies or not. So um, that would be my, my main question. So th think as legislators and, and give us some advice uh, because uh, I understand that it's quite, that there are many contradictions. We need definitely more studies, but at this point, 5G is being deployed. We have devices that can use 5G and um, I'm, I'm happy that some uh, the scientific advisory mechanism is activated and we will have more studies. I consider the, the, your study in STOA and uh, the SAM study that will be quite independent. Thank okay. you, G. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for a long question, it must be said. I hope others will perhaps be a little more brief, if, that, if I can say so. And to whom should we address the question? I think uh, it boiled down to, to, given the uncertainties and lack of knowledge about 5G, would the speakers be happy living in a city where it is rolled out sort of now? I think if I ask Rodney that question, and with respect, Elizabeth, um, then we can confine the answers to just those two. Rodney? Uh, yeah, look, from... Uh I'd say absolutely there's no problem at all. You're looking at very similar levels and uh, just to point out that there isn't the uncertainty that the moderator has suggested. Yes. There's very good science out there and that science shows us that it's not a problem. If there was a reason and you, someone could provide a good reason, then certainly we'd have to look at it differently. But the science is good. Thank you. Well, if I could be cheeky and ask Rodney, uh, Professor Lin, who's the editor of the Bioelectronic Magnetics Journal and used to be an ICNA advisor for many years. He's since become more independent and is academic and so on. He now thinks that the animal evidence is clear and convincing uh, for cancer. Would you accept his advice still? Yeah, no, look, um, Jim, uh, again, you say that now that he's more independent, all ICNERP commissioners are 100% independent and they can say whatever they like. Um, in terms of his views about, uh, about carcinogenicity, he has not provided any reasons. This, uh, and so, no, I, I don't accept that. Okay, that's if he could clear. provide a good reason, then yeah. it would be a different story. Okay, that's clear cut. I think, uh, not for me to say. Uh, Elizabeth, on the question, living in Barcelona, happy to see 5G rolled out now, or would you prefer more research to be done first? <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Okay. 
Uh, no, I, well, I mean, 5G is being rolled out already, you know, although, of course, very minimally. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned, um, a big question really is about exposure level and, uh, you know, the, the, the massive MIMO and the beam forming, you know, raise some questions about exposure that we hadn't seen before. Um, I think Arnaud presented it very well. Uh, what we want to know is whether there might be, for example, hotspots for the users of, of uh, particular devices and so on. So what I would uh, strongly uh, recommend is setting up some kind of a surveillance program, uh, a surveillance of exposure, really, um, because that's what we really miss right now. Um, so this could be done, for example, by setting up population surveys in a number of different uh, cities and countries and having periodic surveys uh, just to look at the evolution of uses and the evolution of exposures in the population. Okay. okay, lovely. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Another policy initiative there. Uh, this is to Professor Cardus. Um, when you recommended precautionary action to limit EMF RF exposures in 2011, um, how would you describe the strength of the evidence uh, available to just that recommendation? And in contrast, how would you describe the current strength of the evidence uh, for cancer in humans from radiofrequency radiation? Uh, thank you for your question. <clears throat> I don't actually think that I recommended a precautionary principle. Uh, I, I did mention caution, but I did not make a recommendation for precautionary principle. Um, concerning the strength of the evidence, so we have a little bit more epidemiological studies and a few studies uh, that will be published very quickly. I think probably the largest uh, new piece of evidence comes from an experimental work uh, the studies which were uh, discussed earlier uh, from the NTP in the United States and from the uh, Hamasini Institute in Italy. Um, I would not prejudge an evaluation. Uh, I understand that um, a high priority has been given to a reevaluation of radiofrequency radiation by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. So um, I think we'll have to wait. Okay, thanks, uh, Elizabeth. Just to clarify for people, uh, the WHO IARC body, where Elizabeth worked for many years, categorizes evidence into just basically four areas. The top is probable human. The second is a uh, mistake, sorry. The top is proven human. The second is probable. The third is possible. And the fourth is we can't really evaluate it. IARC last looked at the RF evidence uh, on cancer and related issues in 2011 and concluded that it was a possible carcinogen on the basis really of just two sets of studies, one by Elizabeth, Interphone and friends, and one done by Hardell. Uh, they have been asked to, as a high priority, to reevaluate the evidence now, given several more epi studies and the quite uh, powerful animal studies mentioned earlier. Okay, thank you very much for that question, Tom. I wonder whether the, any of the MEPs uh, tried to come in. Uh, hi, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, uh, I actually thought uh, I, I should ask my question in the chat, uh, and I, uh, I sent it uh, uh, in the chat, but I, I, will, I will ask. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think uh, recommendations or even restrictions are needed uh, regarding vulnerable people, vulnerable groups, uh, such uh, as pregnant women and children? For example, recommendations uh, for mobile devices used for pregnant women or uh, restrictions for mass uh, construction, mass uh, installment uh, near schools. Uh, are you aware of such restrictions or recommendations? Um, uh, if such restrictions or recommendations uh, are already introduced uh, by some countries? Okay, so uh, I think the question was about uh, extra special protection via exposure limits, lower ones presumably, for, for vulnerable groups like uh, fetuses, children, etc. I think we should ask that uh, very quickly to Rodney, who uh, re recommends limits, and to Elizabeth and to Fiorella. Uh, if you could give short answers to that very important question, that would be great. Yes, so firstly, Rodney. Uh, yeah, look, this is something that's been looked at in great detail over probably the last 15 years, and there's no evidence that there's uh, any difference uh, in terms of health outcome as a function of age or any sensitive population. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth? 
Uh, in terms of whether this has happened anywhere, I know that some years ago there were recommendations in some countries uh, to use uh, cabled internet uh, in um, kindergartens and primary schools. Uh, I don't know whether that is still the case or not. Okay, and Fiorella? Voglio certainly. Well, I'd like to talk about the study of the National Toxicology. Uh, Institute. Uh, it looked at uh, gestation in uh, mothers and uh, this was an experiment which uh, aimed to reprodu reproduce a uh, situation similar to that in men. We looked at uh, animals throughout uh, their lives and uh, we looked at uh, exposure above the levels uh, recommended by IGNIP. I think that our study and uh, the NTP study showed results linked to, to the duration. The NTP uh, study was carried out later in mice and uh, there wasn't any significant uh, result so, embryos, uh, children, um, mothers, uh, and vulnerable groups need to be studied as a priority. Um, although I did uh, live in Rome for about a year, my Eng uh, English translation sort of dived off there. So I heard some beautiful Italian, but not much English. But I got the last line, I think, which was to say, you do feel that there are um, vulnerable groups that need uh, better protection. Um, I note, by the way, that in the ionizing radiation field that I played in for many years, there are separate limits for such um, uh, vulnerable uh, categories, such as uh, young children and so on. Okay, so I think at this point, we've probably exhausted the time available for generic questions, so I think it's appropriate for me now to hand over to uh, the two MEPs who have kindly organized this, uh, this event. And I think... Um, 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 Arno uh, goes first, not Arno, uh, excuse me, excuse me while I grab my papers. Ivo Christoph, I think, wants to go first this time with his final remarks, followed by Michel Rivasi. Ivo. Thank you, David. And thank you to all of the researchers who have managed to participate in the debate, putting questions and explaining their positions. I think this has been a very interesting debate and has shown that uh, 5G does uh, have an impact on uh, man and the environment. It is an important study as has been shown for months, the lack of sufficient research is very important here. We need to think about the possible effects. It would be wrong to uh, run a risk, albeit a minimal risk, uh, of this type. And I think that the plan of action for 5G which will be published by the Commission, should take account of the uh, safety recommendations uh, put forward by the research community. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the speakers, because uh, the debate has been uh, very uh, profitable and uh, we have uh, seen different opinions here. On the one hand, we have ICNIP with uh, Professor Croft, who says no uncertainty. We've taken all of the precautions. Pregnant women, children are protected. And at the same time, he says, but when it comes to the environment, there's no effect. Uh, but we just uh, deal with men and mankind. Well, that's a problem for me. There's an ICNIP report and when I see the certainties you have uh, Dr. Croft I have a doubt because uh, when you're a scientist you never have certainty listening to the different speakers
there are major uh, gaps when it comes to 5G. There are frequencies, 3.5, 3.7 megahertz, where there aren't a lot of uh, studies. In addition, we have all of the millimeter waves over 24, 25 megahertz, very few uh, uh, studies on that. That was confirmed by the director of Ramazzini and other people as well. So there is a problem here. And the proof is that you know that uh, in France, Paris airports have uh, banned 5G uh, antennae because uh, they feel that there is electromagnetic incompatibility with uh, the apparatus and the devices and airplanes, so there is a risk there. So we have developed 5G without taking account of all of the precautions, uh, technical incompatibility and environmental precautions as well. So when, we s when you say that there's no uncertainty, that can't be true. And Mr. Franz Kacher, the representative of the Commission, you said something that was very interesting. You said we need an independent and robust evaluation. I agree with you. Let's set up a group of experts in Europe, but uh, don't have ICNIP as a reference uh, body. You said the 1999 recommendations are still valid. No, you can't say that. Commission representative, because NTP Ramazzini studies show the carcinogenic effects. These are robust, solid studies which call into question the 1990 recommendations, so they need to be reviewed. And when you say that there is Horizon Europe and money is being paid for 5G, you can see that you're putting the cart before the horse here. How can you say there are studies missing and at the same time uh, 5G is being rolled out? It's not possible. If we really want to restore consumer or citizen confidence, because I represent uh, citizens in France, and people are refusing 5G, they're saying, let's have a democratic debate. Let's look at all of the studies. If there are studies missing, let's carry them out before we roll out 5G. So I'd like to repeat the fact that uh, we need to have a moratorium here. Thank you to all of the experts who took the floor because you confirmed the fact that we do need a moratorium, a moratorium until we have all of these studies and then we can see whether there's an added value in 5G not just 5G for industrialists, but also 5G for consumers and for European citizens. Thank you. Thank you for this exchange of views. We will continue with the report on health, but you can uh, see that in humans and in the environment and in plants, invertebrates, etc., we can see that there are athermal and thermal effects Thank you. I'm counting on the European Commission to review the recommendations to do the evaluation uh, and make sure it's carried out by an independent committee. Thank you. Je redonne la parole à David. I'll give the floor back to David G. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought, um, as ever, MEPs would have the last word, but uh, that's very generous. Can I just thank everybody concerned for condensing a lot of stuff into two hours? Uh, you can see the need for a much more in-depth investigation. The state of New Hampshire has just produced a 200-page report uh, following an investigation, uh, querying experts in front of them, stakeholder-driven, uh, produced a majority report wanting various recommendations and so on, and a, minor and a minority report too. Uh, but it was in-depth. They took their time. They took evidence over a year, year and a half, uh, and it was a very thorough process. I could recommend something similar at, at European level. But meanwhile, can we all thank STOA and the MEPs involved for putting the event together, the panelists, the speakers, and all the technical people who made a complicated thing happen without much uh, 
hiccup at all. And I think therefore I should say this is the end, and uh, but this is not the end of the story. I'm sure many of us will be meeting each other over these issues in, in years to come. Thank you. Can I say particularly thank you to Gianluca of Stoa, with whom I've been working for some months to, to make this event happen. It was postponed from April, was going to be alive, which would have been great, but being virtual has had its own uh, advantages, I think, as well. Not least, uh, not much CO2 expended in getting here. So thank you very much, Gianluca, and to the Stoa team, and that's me, over and out. Bye-bye.